Hey, I'm Michael, and this is Michael in the Middle. It's an intergenerational relational podcast for people who are interested in better human interaction. I'm glad you're here. Well, here we are again, uh, Michael in the Middle, and it's good to be back live with somebody um, besides myself on the podcast. I don't know how you all have been feeling about it if you're going sequentially, but it's been a while since I had somebody on the other side of the, of the camera and the microphone. And uh, man, I, I couldn't be happier to have my dear friend, Greg Ruff over there on the other side. Um, Greg, man, it's been almost a year since you wow. interviewed me for that very first Michael in the middle episode and uh, been a pretty interesting ride. It, it ended up, it's ended up being a pretty good year so far. And uh, I have so many reasons to, to give thanks for you. Uh, personal friendship aside, you've been a real help to me with a lot of different things that I've done professionally. And even with an attempt like this to, to fire up a, a, a podcast. So at the outset, thank you uh, for being a friend, um, you know, and, and not just because that was a really cool song back a few years ago. <laughs> Andrew Gold. I was, uh, I was going to say that's. I actually heard that one the other day. It's on my. It's on my playlist, and I had it. I had it on my summer list, so it, it made it in there. So yeah, I, thank you, great. Michael, very much. Uh, and I really appreciate it because you've you've done the same thing for me, and uh, we we've been good friends, and we've paid each other back many many times, and we've never asked for that, right? So and that's what friends are for. That's another. Uh, <laughs> Song too, so, we, but maybe we could just do a whole pod with just <laughs> lots of songs, you know. But, uh, but but you know that you know that that's what life's about. And uh, as I've gotten older, that that's it means a lot more to me than than anything. So uh, yeah. let's get after it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, Greg Ruff, sports information director for is it twenty five years now, Trebekah. Yep, absolutely. Seems like. Seems like I was just uh, rolling onto campus with the job, had no idea what I was doing. I'd always worked in the media side. I'd kind of worked a little bit in media relations, but but mostly broadcast and uh, sports talk and sports broadcasting, news, radio, music, all that kind of stuff. And so I knew what it was I needed to do on the other side. But yeah, I, I you know, I walked in. I never forget. I, I was probably two or three days in. I was like, what did they do? Why did they hire me? I don't, I don't know what I, I've never done this stuff, but we figured it out over time. And, and again, like I said, I knew what, I knew what the media needed. I knew what needed to go out. And uh, I've often said it was a perfect time for me to get the job because sports information became media production over the next few years. And that's what it is now is sports information is producing the media for people to cover because the big time media can't cover uh, colleges like Trevecca or even SEC schools like they would want to, other than the uh, SEC football and basketball and baseball, maybe. So you do carry uh, an associate athletic director of athletics title, correct? I mean, in, I do absolutely. Media, yep. and sports information. I think I'm right. Yep, absolutely. I. How did you get started in the media business to begin with? Well, it started started uh, essentially here at Trevecca, but it probably started. Uh, when I bought my mom a transistor radio for uh, Christmas or her birthday, and uh, and then I occupied it and used it to listen to St. Louis Cardinals games and NFL games and Monday Night Football and everything else underneath my pillow and uh, just fell in love with broadcasting. And then I found my way sneaking up into press boxes at different venues and uh, just fell in love with with that side of things and always dreamed of it. And then got really good at being the caller that DJs and talk show hosts took to put on the air, even as a young kid. And so I just got enamored with, with all of that. And, um, and then I came to Trevecca and they had a radio station back then. And I, uh, Gary Ragsdale invited me to come sit in with his, one of my sweet mates, Invited me to come sit in on one of his shifts down at WNAZ. Yeah. And then uh, before you know it, they they actually put me on the air. And uh, that's how that's how it started. Man, that is so cool. And and is I mean, just as an aside, 
for those of us who know a lot of people associated with Trebekah, um, you mentioned Gary Ragsdale and mm -hmm. a, a guy that you and I have dealt with as much as anybody in Trebekah athletics across the last, you know, goodness, you could say 40 years or so. One of the Trebekah athletic family's biggest boosters was, yeah is still Gary Ragsdale's father, J. Dwight Ragsdale, who yeah. founded the uh, Trojan Booster Endowment and uh, has helped supply, um, goodness, close to a million dollars in, in uh, additional scholarship funds across 30 plus years. I mean, visionary. And it's, and it's going to continue. The, the vision that he had with uh, with Homer Adams and, and, and different people that were involved yeah. in that, there's over a million dollars in the corpus generating interest and will forever and the corpus will grow continue to grow even with what yeah. it is and then continue to supply athletes forever it, so and greg doesn't that speak to the power of uh, an idea that has a chance to be put into motion i mean I, I, that that's something that i think you know you have been able to do across the years so effectively and before you got to trebekah i know you were with uh couple of different radio stations in town and and to my knowledge you've never had a lot of budget money to work with and yet you've been able to produce a product what what is it about a good idea given just even a modicum of of uh of support financially that ends up really making a huge impact well you know i i think uh, i think actually a good example of that is uh during covid you myself uh, David Klimkowski, uh put into action. How do, how do we adjust to COVID? We couldn't be in front of each other. And we figured out, all of us combined, how to do a live video broadcast with people in multiple locations live on the Internet. And we yep. were one of the first to do it, if not the, one, the first to do it, they talked about us at COSIDA, which is the college, uh, which was now renamed, but College Sports Information Directors at the convention because people that I talked to uh, retold the story of how we did that. And uh, it was pretty cool uh, that we were able to do that. And we called it the Purple Ties. You called it the Purple Ties. I think you just, yeah. that's the name you came up with. But we ended up doing it. Very similar to this, but people, had, people weren't doing it back then and not doing it live. We did it live, which was... Uh, fantastic with we had up to five people all in different locations coming together for for a live broadcast live interview called purple ties uh, uh, multiple times so that was something that you know it took a little bit of money but not a lot it took mostly ingenuity and uh, just being willing to go after it and get it done and and, and finding the goal I, I want to come back to some Trebekah moments because you and I have lived a lot of those together yeah on the, but um I know you've done some work for ESPN and and other networks. What are what are some things that you can look back on? You didn't you weren't you the play by play guy for Belmont basketball for a while as well? I I was. I did I did Belmont uh, basketball for uh, about ten years. Uh, did men's and women's uh, basketball mo more men than women, but did a lot of Tony Cross's uh, really great uh, Rebelette teams is what they called them back then, and. Yeah. Uh, and then did uh, Rick Bird. I think it was his second or third year I started doing that. It was right when I got done with Trevecca. And I didn't have anywhere to broadcast. So uh, I was like, there's this guy, Rick Bird, who just started Belmont. I had a pretty good first year. Yeah. I went and talked to him. And then I went and talked to their uh, AD, Kenny Sidwell, who just passed away recently. And he's really? in the OVC Hall of Fame, the Belmont Hall yeah. of Fame. Just a great guy. Pitched it to him, and then I went to a radio station that I had done some high school sports with while I was at Trevecca, and I pitched them, and uh, we went out and started selling it and did a few games that first year, and uh, and then it just grew to where we were doing all the games, and, and it was, a, it was a, a great time. I ended up transitioning with them through to NCAA, but obviously there was a lot of games. The, one of the first games that, uh, that – well, maybe the hardest game I ever broadcast – was the first Trevecca Belmont game that I had to do. And that was really, really hard. And uh, <laughs> all, all of them were difficult, but that first one, like, I, you know, having to be excited for Belmont yeah. against Trevecca, 
is, you know, I, I mean, I'm just being honest. It was, it is one of the hardest things uh, to to do, and uh, pulled it off. And uh, no one ever complained uh, that I wasn't uh, homer uh, enough for Belmont because I was. I mean, that, they were that was my team. I, I had invested right. in, in getting that together. Anyway, so I, I tell you, what, one of the, one of the there was a ton of memorable games. I mean, there was just obviously Rick Bird and that crew had uh, some great runs, but. The, the they went to back to back final fours in the NAI. And the second one was the very next year, back to back years. And they had a senior laden team, like all these great guys who they returned almost the entire team. They're ranked number one, I think, in the preseason. But they just had a had a senior itis year. Like they just didn't play anywhere near what everybody thought they were. And so they went into the tournament not seated very high. And it was either the first or second game they had to play Life College University, and they were ranked number two, and yeah. got down. I think it was seventeen to them in the second half, and they came back and won by one. I think it was seventy four seventy three. Wow! And I got. I'll never forget. This. I, I, it was, they were making the run, and I, you know how you can feel it. They hadn't caught up yet, but you could feel they were going to do it. And then the seniors had finally figured it out. We got to play. <laughs> And they started playing like everybody thought they would. And they came from 17 down to the number two team in the country in the second half and won it. And it was about two minutes to go. And I, I started getting emotional, you know, because because <laughs> I was so happy for them that they had found it. And, and they made, went on, uh, turned that corner and went to the final four and lost, I think, to the eventual champion that year. And so that those are memories uh, with Belmont uh, and getting to do their first NCAA game as an NCAA member and and just all that kind of stuff was was a lot of fun. I know where I was um, when uh, you know we we pulled off the Music City Miracle. We being the Tennessee Titans, mm -hmm. I, I, was with, yeah. I was with uh, our our two older sons, Chad and Brian, in the in the living room at our house. And of course, when Buffalo, you know, was able to 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 go ahead of us there at the end of the game. You know, so few seconds left on the clock. Of, of course, we were all, oh man, you know what a yeah. what a what a bummer and all of that. And and I know where we were when when Mike Keith started yelling, "There are no flags." I, I mean, we were watching it on TV, but Mike Keith's you know historic call with that, "There are no flags." You know, we were running, we ran out from the house and just started screaming in the front yard. But I, yeah. I think I remember you were, you were right there, weren't you? I, I was, I was on the field as it was back in the day, when you worked the games in the press box. They allowed you to come down uh, in the fourth quarter. Now they had switched it by then to the last two minutes. Okay. So you had to, you had to time it to get to the elevators or take the stairs. And you had to make sure you didn't get caught by the coaches in the press box coming down, too, because they locked out the, the elevators then. So I headed down to the field. Titans were ahead. I come out of the tunnel, and I don't know how much time was left at that point, but Buffalo scored, like, right when to go ahead, right when I came out of the tunnel out onto the field. And so everybody's like, you know, this stinks. You know, this is – and the, the stadium was deflated and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, the, the – they kick it off, and I kind of lean down, and I see the ball go flying over to the other side. I, don't, I can't see what it is. I kind of look up at the uh, Jumbotron, and I see what's happening then. <laughs> and then I look down. I look down, and I'm like, I may not have been on the field, but I was almost on the field. But I'm looking down the sideline because all the Titans are leaning in, too, and all the media are. And I see Dyson. There's nobody between me and Dyson. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. And the cra you just feel the stadium going crazy because everybody can see what's what's happening. And he scores. And he runs right in front of me. I mean, I'm all, I've am got a screenshot of, uh, I think it was ABC uh, had it. And I'm in, I'm in the background when he's right when he's crossing the uh, goal. I think I was about the 5 or 10-yard line. I think Hope Hines was there, Paul Kaharski, Pogue was there, Dubin was there. All those guys are all, all around. You can see them, too. But. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen in the world. So I get, I, I'm doing live reports for multiple people, including ESPN, Fox, and, and different ones. So I get on the phone with ESPN right after the score. And, they, and they're like, they don't normally do this. I'm just reporting the score. 
And they said, can you go live right now? I said, sure. So they go live with me. So I'm live on ESPN. I can't hear anything. <laughs> I hear the tone. I hear the tone, which indicated they had gone to me. So I just start talking. And uh, and that's when the replay was taken and they confirmed that it was good. And the it was just pandemonium. <laughs> I mean, you could literally, the stadium, that people were just going like, it was, you know, like a lot of times people cheer all at once in unison. It, people didn't know what to do. They were just going crazy. And it was it was one of the wildest things I've ever uh, obviously experienced in my life. And I was glad to be there. And it was it was a lot of fun. Any other uh, particular great sports memories that you either witnessed or participated in or were on the call for uh, before? Well, there, we... There's 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 quite a few. I, I got to I got to we talked I just go back to Belmont uh, for a minute. I got to. Uh, be at the game where Joe Bailey scored 58 at Lipscomb and, and they beat, they beat Lipscomb. And that was just a huge monumental uh, win for them. Just seeing Bailey develop as a player, kind of like Will Purdue in that era went yeah. from somebody who was about out of basketball and ended up being player of the year, you know, uh, in the NAI. And, and so that, that was pretty cool. When I was a kid, when I was in high school, I, I, I grew up in Jefferson City, Missouri, North Little Rock, and back and forth. We lived in Jeff City twice, and so my formidable years were there. But in the middle of my junior year, we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was on the wrestling team there. And one of the things that our wrestling team had is they had an inn with the Charlotte Coliseum to usher events. So I got to see all kinds of concerts and all that kind of stuff. But also, I got to work uh, the USA um, Bernard Taylor was from Charlotte and he was, a uh, on the USA, uh, boxing team and they hosted it there. Howard Cosell comes into USA versus Cuba. And if you remember, it was during the, the Iran hostage situation. And wow. so there was like 15 hostages there. So the backdrop is that we may or may not go to the Olympics at that. It's not known at that time. So right. this is a huge, you know, USA is really big in boxing. Cuba was big in boxing. 1980. Wasn't it? 1980, 1980. It was, it was, it was 1980. And, uh, so I got to work that and, uh, got to get there early and saw Howard Cosell coming in and, you know, people there early were chanting how he's got a toupee, how he's got a toupee <laughs> and Howard Cosell, you know, is huge. I mean, he's, he's, he was big already then, but especially with boxing, you know, yeah, and, uh, just a controversial figure already by this, by this time. And, uh, so I'm like, I'm like, right next to him multiple times. And, and then he, he went to the bathroom and they said, how he's got to go to the bathroom. They started literally started chanting how he's got to go to the bathroom. So it was kind of a, kind of a neat thing. He played up to the crowd. He loved that kind of stuff. And so anyway, I ended up getting on TV, standing by him multiple times while he was interviewing different people. He interviewed uh, Alex. Uh, was it Alex? Uh, uh, I forgot. I forgot his name. Hold on one second. Uh, Alex Ramos, who won by knockout over Cordero, uh, the Cuban, and it was the place just went bonkers, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then um, it was just a, it was just a great thing. Big John Tate was the heavyweight champion at the time. He came uh, to it. Yeah. There was all kind, of, and I got and I got I was standing. They introduced Big John Tate, and I was actually watching the uh, the VIPs, and I didn't even realize he was there. I and everybody's looking behind me, and I turn around, and there's Big John Tate standing right there. You know, I'm a little bit shorter than him, but. I mean, it's one of those events that you're at that you just you don't even realize at the time how big it was because of the political unrest that was going on and just the whole thing about the Olympics. I think the Olympics were going to be in Moscow. So that was very huge uh, in, in the media. And, you know, there was no ESPN back then. It was on ABC Wild World of Sports. And so all my friends back in Missouri saw me because I, I wore my letterman's jacket. And so I went back to a wrestling camp that summer and, and they were uh, – Everybody was asking me, was that you on, on TV? And so every, I mean, like, that was something everybody watched, you know, back then. So it's pretty cool. That's that's fantastic. When you were a kid growing up, who, I mean, were you really into um, Major League Baseball, the NFL? I mean, who were your favorite teams? Oh, for? yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Cardinals uh, growing up in uh, – Jefferson City, Missouri, and uh, and then down in down in Arkansas, it's Cardinals are kind of the team back then. It was my dad's team. My mom uh, grew up listening to to my KMOX, and then the Royals had some really good teams when I was growing up. And so with Brett and all those guys, uh, you know, became a fan of them as well. Whitey Herzog going back and forth. The Royals and 
Cardinals had some players go back and forth with each other. Daryl Porter is one of those. And so grew up with them, the Chiefs and the St. Louis Cardinals. My wrestling coach in high school was an offensive lineman for Jim Hart with the St. Louis Cardinals, football Cardinals. So and Missouri, you know, Missouri and Arkansas. And uh, so just uh, those were the those were the teams that I that I followed a great deal. That's so cool. So did you ever have a moment where you said, I really like how my voice sounds in a microphone and, and I think I could do this for a living. You know, I, I never, um, I never thought about my voice until much later. And, uh, you know, but people, when I started doing it, people were like, you got it. You got a really good voice. And I was, and I just, I just couldn't believe it. I didn't, I didn't know why they would say that because I just, I felt like I sound like everybody else, but my, you know, my mom and dad both have very good voices. My, uh, grandfather on my dad's side or my mom's side was a was a minister nazarene preacher started the mountain home church of the Nazarene, twin lakes church of the nazarene and uh he had a, he had a really good voice and so I, I don't know i guess maybe i just got it through that i can tell you this god gave me a speaking voice not a singing voice so that has been very clear to me over the years <laughs> yeah so uh so uh but yeah i mean at, at some point when i was doing the the Trevecca stuff early on um, you know, people, people said about my voice and David Deese was here and worked with me on my voice and how to, how to do things in the classes. And then just even air checking us and things like that. And then our, my cohorts at, uh, WNAZ, we would, we would check our own demo tapes and just, and it, our air checks and give each other tips and stuff like that. And we'd analyze them in class and whatever. And so after a while I started hearing my voice played back and I was like, yeah, I mean, that sounds, sounds okay. You know? Uh, and then I began to work on it over the years and uh, yeah. learned to, to do more. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I, you know, I did public address for basketball games, counting, um, you know, all the years that I did it at Trevecca, 31 seasons at mm -hmm. Trevecca. And I did five seasons of uh, NAI basketball in the 90s out at Southern Nazarene University in Oklahoma. And, you know, I mean, at, at some point, you, you have to combine maybe a gift that you've been given with a, with a passion that, that, you know, you want to pursue something. And so when I first started doing the announcing at Trevecca, I was a senior in college and um, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just talking and I was yelling a lot of the time, you know, cause I would get excited <laughs> and all that. Yeah. And I, I think being able to do radio and or public address, the, the voiceover kinds of things, I think you just described it very well. You, if you don't work on it, it's mm -hmm. just like any other gift. If you don't, if you don't work on your craft, even if you have a gift, it won't be as good as it can be. And I, I think that's one of the things that, athletics actually helps illustrate as much as anything um yeah because right, it, let, me, let me go to the, let me go to that point in case anybody is watching that would ever want to do it and <clears throat> i know now at six years of age i know i you know, i got i've got a good voice and it works and it works good for that i could walk out here and you could throw a ball out there and give me a couple of rosters and i could broadcast the game and i could get through it but i don't feel comfortable even to this day, not doing at least, say it's a basketball game, doing at least two hours of prep work. If I don't do yeah. two hours of prep work, I don't feel yeah. like I'm ready to do the broadcast at the level that I'm capable of doing. And I would like to do more than that. And as the year goes on with a team, that might actually get more time because you have more things to cover and talk about and tell. Because yeah. you want to have, and you want to have it up here, you may write it down, but you want to have it up here. And doing the prep work is how that gets there. And so then you're just, you're in the flow of the game and something happens and you're like, oh, I've got that little note over here and it can just flow out. If you got to go over here and look for it, it might be too late and you're going to interrupt your flow. So, so yeah, I think you have to work at it. I, I will tell you this, Michael, for, for at least the first 25 years that I broadcast, I've recorded everything I did. I don't care if it was a talk show, an interview, a <laughs> broadcast, and I would listen to it. And and sometimes more than once. And I would critique myself yeah. through that 
all the time. And that helped me as much as anything. You know, you'd be on a, you know, this, you were on buses. I remember being on the Vanderbilt women's bus, Belmont, uh, traveling with the, uh, did the Nashville stars, which was a, was a pro basketball league, six, six and under yeah. league here. I recorded all that stuff. And then I would, when we were on the way back or I was in the hotel room or something like that, I would listen to it. And that was one of the favorite things I would do. I'd, and I'd always bring, if I was on a long trip and we're going to be on a bus, I'd bring my Walkman and, uh, and just play back and listen to it. So that, to me, that would be something that if, if somebody ever wants to get a bit, that's how hard you have to work because everybody else is doing the same thing. And I only did that so I could keep up with what everybody else and get more opportunities. Don't you think that applies across all the disciplines? You know, I mean, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, you look at, you look at whatever occupation or pursuits people, in, or, you know, embrace or, or avocational, you know, things that they just want to, they give their, heart joy i mean it it does take a gift plus grit and determination and practice and all of that so yeah and you've been a you've been a great example of that Um, let me put a cap on that my i wrestled in high school so i'd go to school go to practice come home have to do school work and then my dad would come up and he would say he would know who my next opponent was going to be and he'd say, "I bet so and so is working out right now." <laughs> and I'd go, I'd go, I'd go get my dad's workout in to get yeah. ready. And I think that's what made me a better wrestler as well. I was a good wrestler, but I, I became a a ranked wrestler because of that extra work that I put in. Uh, oftentimes after after practice in school and before going to bed. This this would be very difficult for me. Maybe it's going to be difficult for you and and for you know people who listen to the podcast who, who aren't connected really to any sort of uh, Trebekah Trojan history, you know, maybe it won't mean quite as much, but I would love for you to tell me about two or three moments that will forever be stamped in your mind and why somebody who isn't associated with Trebekah might be interested in, in the moment. Oh man. You know, I, you kind of tipped me off about this yesterday, and I've, I've thought about it. I, it is so hard to get it down to, to a few. So I, I don't want anyone who does know about the history of Trebekah to think sure. anything less of anything else because there are so many. I could, we, we could do two hours of this, well, and I yeah, still wouldn't get to everything. That's so, the point. We don't, we don't have enough time yeah, to get yeah. all of them that are deserving. But, so these are just almost, you know, pull – Pull a pull a moment out of a hat kind of situation here. Yeah, the the first one that always comes to mind is the double overtime uh, District Twenty Four, I guess semifinal. It was Trevecca and Lipscomb uh, in eighty seven, and Trevecca beat Lipscomb in double overtime here in the Trojan Field. That's where I am now, uh, and I was broadcasting right over there, and uh, Avery Patton. Just helped. I mean, there was a whole lot more than Avery Patton to it, but Avery Patton was the leader of that clear leader of that team, beating the defending national champions and ending their season on this court. That was unbelievable. And these were, you know, those were my classmates. You know, those were the guys that I went to sat in class with, you know, and traveled right. with, and and had been for a few years at that point, and to to get to broadcast that game still means everything to me and to say that i was one of the ones who who broadcast that um I, i'm going to go right back to belmont one one quick one because of because i mentioned that one getting to broadcast the battle of the boulevard the one that made it the battle of the boulevard there were previous ones but lipscomb and, and belmont at vanderbilt with a sold out fifteen thousand whatever oh. it was that was yeah. I, I was i broadcast that game and wow. that was that was that was unbelievable to get to broadcast there at Vanderbilt's Memorial Gym and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that one. But there's so many other games. Uh, I, one of the, this the game at Lyon with Michael Blevins scoring. I think it was seven points in about I don't know. A, Less than thirty seconds. I, I tried to go back and find out for sure. Get was the that numbers? I think I think I may have been with you on that trip. Was that I think when so. Charge on the baseline. Yes. Uh, yep. 
yep. to the free throw line yep. that, that won us the game? Yes, absolutely. That was it. That game was um, was so special. I, I love Michael Blevins and what he brought. You know, local kid went off uh, to JUCO because he couldn't get a D1 offer. Got a D1 offer, went to play D1, got hurt, and then decided he wanted to come home. And depending on who you believe, Sam or Michael, Michael had to talk his way into Sam signing. I don't think Sam, I think Sam was fine to take him. Uh, he played at Mississippi Valley State and was a great player. Came here, but just another guy similar to an Avery Patton. He had talent around him, but he was the guy that pulled them there to the to the national tournament. Yeah. And that and Michael helped pull us to the national tournament that year. We were essentially the 32nd seed. We played the number one team, led them at halftime, and uh, ended up losing uh, that game, but kind of got on the map and everything. That kind of turned the corner, getting us back to the national tournament on a regular basis. But Michael was a big part of that. And then was an assistant coach during that time, now a very successful uh, business person in town. And, and uh, But just I, I loved him and loved how he did it. So it comes back to people a lot of times, right? So I'm going to tell you about a women's basketball game right here in this gym. Uh, our women's program has is, is gotten some national recognition, but we're playing SNU, ranked number one in the country here. Southern Nazarene and University. Southern yeah. Nazarene. Yep, yep. Sorry, I, I just assumed everybody was Nazarene watching. But <laughs> uh, but Jennifer Wilson hits they, – they call timeout. Time's running out. She hits one with time expiring to give us the win over SNU. And that just meant a lot because Jennifer Wilson is the daughter of Frank Wilson, who was the coach here, took us to the first national tournament. And her dad also beat the tar out of me in racquetball often. So, uh, so, so we, uh, but that, that meant a whole lot as well, uh, because of Jennifer used to watch her shooting pregame halftime after the game, all that kind of stuff on the floor and just knowing what it meant to her and her parents and, and a lot of other people that had, that had followed her career. So though, you know, man, I could, I could just, I could keep going on the, the, uh, the uh, baseball. Can I get one baseball in? Besides yeah. the year we went to the uh, carry to the, to the College World Series, it was uh, 2006 at Cumberland playing the Cumberlands in an elimination game, and we're down. And um, Zach Hilliard hits a, I believe it was a three-run home run for us to win to get to the championship game. And got us within a game of going to the uh, uh, to the NAI World Series. We ended up losing to Cumberland, just ran out of pitching. But that was just an exciting game. It was on Mother's Day, and we had to play two games, and uh, it was just pretty awesome because my my wife and uh, my daughter were there, and I think it was it was the second or third Mother's Day that we'd been together. So my wife was a trooper and came out to uh, Lebanon to watch a doubleheader. On, on Mother's Day, and it was really cold, by the way. It was freezing out there. But anyway, it was. Those are just. I, and I could, and Michael, I could keep going on. It's just a lot of great uh, stories with softball, volleyball, just all the sports. You, you've called some great moments from games. What are some things that have stood out to you about some of the athletes, student athletes that you've helped tell stories about that 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 move you? Well, there's one very fresh in my mind. Carolyn Hampton Cole now, uh, who was track and field cross well cross country. We didn't have track and field uh, then. I think I can't remember. She no, it was it was before track. Uh, but she was national national level runner, even as a freshman. Just took the conference by storm, and we're in the D two era at that point. And uh, she really helped, you know, put our cross country program and help fuel us to get towards having track and uh, made it to nationals and ran and um, just a great person uh, had some difficult things to overcome, including injuries and uh, the loss of her father later. Uh, she ended up marrying David Cole, whose uh, father, Joe uh, yeah. has passed away now and was just a great man here uh, teaching yeah. at Trevecca and, uh, and the whole Cole family just uh, think the world of them. And so she is just qualified, came back through all those injuries, got back and has worked her way back in uh, and has reached a Olympic trials qualifying time. It's going to go to the Olympic trials. 
and that's just uh, she's just somebody that I think so much of. And uh, but there's just there's just top of top a ton of those. Brandon Howard stands out always to me because um, he uh, because of the injury that he had that ended his career during the Union game here, Union basketball game, and uh, was probably going to be the Player of the Year in the conference. And it was late in the year, but uh, not late enough to to overcome uh, other people coming in. And his teammate ends up getting player of the year, Eric Price. They interrupted the game, had to stop the game because it was such a gruesome injury. And uh, i never forget, we had uh, probably three or four of the local TV stations were there. The place was packed. It yeah. Before air conditioning in the Trojan Fieldhouse. And he, he went down and... Uh, we, he and I kind of had a had a bond anyway before that because that was the year that Robert Garrett had passed away before the season. Right. And uh, I had gone with them to take their media picture down on the new bridge downtown. And uh, just uh, just had a unique bond with that team that year and for that to happen to him. And I'll never forget, uh, it was uh, a couple of weeks after the season and, and he could have lost his leg. That's how bad the injury was. And it happened to be that Thomas Bird, who was the Titans – uh, physician happened to be here at that game was able to reset his leg and pop his ankle back in socket and keep the circulation going and uh i'll, I'll never forget seeing him uh, a couple weeks after the season after we gotten back from the national tournament and he just said rough that was the hardest thing i've ever gone through in my life and uh and you just see it on his face and you know i don't think he's ever played basketball again uh, I, I, I could be wrong but he ended up being a rapper being a pretty successful rapper successful <laughs> good- business person Family man, and uh, we still we still talk a lot. He came back to homecoming a couple of years ago. Came back for uh, we honored Robert Garrett Jr. Uh, this past year, and he came back for that as well and helped kind of get people there. Just a great guy. But I, you know, again, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of guys and gals that I could mention that have just meant a lot to me over the years. So, so I, I believe this about the kind of work that you've done, and and you know, a lot of people have the capacity to tell other people's stories and, and to do it really well. And and you're certainly one of those. What, what is it about your own personal story, Greg, at this stage of life that keeps you going that, um, you know, you got the work to do. And I know you, 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 one of the biggest fans of, of, you know, Trojan sports and, and sports in general that I've ever that I've ever encountered. And I, I love you for that, but what gives you energy personally these days? What, what do you, what do you, what are you thinking about as you, uh, I mean, you're, you're getting to, you're getting to the point where you, you, you know, you might have to start your age with a six instead of a five. <laughs> well, that's, that happened last September. So was it last year? I, I can't yeah, remember. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm that old. That, we should have done more for your 60th birthday, but uh, <laughs> hats off to you, buddy. Well, I, I got to go see the Cardinals uh, in the okay. new and but what, Bush stadium. What what's what's giving you what's giving you life these days, and and maybe making you want to dig in and 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 leave a leave a mark somewhere that that maybe makes a difference in somebody else's life. Well, you know, um, I'll try to get this out. Um, without without blubbering, uh, but it does mean a lot to me. I when I was at Trevecca, I I messed up. As a I student, made some, I made um, as a student, as a student, as an undergrad, I made some mistakes and uh, made some bad decisions. And uh, I, that was plural, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I got asked to take a break a couple of times, two different times, and. Um, but I was given a chance to come back and prove that that wasn't who I was. And um, I'm about giving people a chance over and over again until they get it right. And I was given that chance. And uh, Trebekah granted me that uh, opportunity. People here at Trebekah uh, offered me that. David Deese, we mentioned him earlier, um, he gave me a chance and other people told him he shouldn't. And I, I know that for a fact. So... Um, and they weren't bad people. They, they, they were doing what they thought was best. So, but, uh, David fought for me and gave me a chance to, 
to prove that. And he saw something in me. And so I, I've always wanted to um, prove him right, number one, but also uh, represent my family, my name and all that kind of stuff. But then uh, as I've gone through this, I've had a lot of people work for me over the years, uh, undergrad students, graduate students, athletes that I've talked to. And I have that story to tell and share with them when they get into difficult times or make bad decisions and things like that. Or maybe they don't do the right thing and to give them an opportunity to, to do that. So I just want to finish strong and I want to finish strong doing that, giving people an opportunity. I want to do a good job. I want to earn my pay. And, uh, and I want to tell the stories of, of people who go out there and, and give it all. Uh, you, you, I want to tell the story of Byron Sanford, the Byron Sanfords of the world who Played on a state championship game and then just didn't get what he wanted. So he just went to University of Kentucky. And I don't know if he tried to make the team or not. But he ended up here at Trevecca and uh, barely got on the court at times early on. And then uh, worked his way fully into the starting lineup and worked hard. I would, I would broadcast games and I would be writing the stories and getting the pictures up and stuff like that. Everybody would clear out. And then Byron would come back in after playing a game and work for another hour or two by himself. He'd put the ball on the floor, get on the floor, get up off the floor, grab the ball, and, and do a layup. Just practicing, scrambling for the ball, and then getting up and immediately going up and doing the score. And he did that over and over and over again. did all kinds of drills. Um, I want to tell a story. He ended up being player of the year. Um after being, I think, second team or honorable mention all conference uh, his junior year, came back and led us back to the uh, championship game uh, in the conference. And I want to tell his story, you know, about guys like that. So I guess that, I guess that if that's it, that's that's uh, kind of. And I, I don't want to represent my family. I got a, I got a wonderful family, and uh, want to represent them, represent our name, and I, and I want to finish strong. Whatever it is I'm doing. You. Uh... You have been a um, a man that that has led cheers for other people for a living, but also because that's who you are. And I guess one of the things that I want to tell you is that you deserve for people to uh, cheer you on as well, because you've you've invested a lot in uh, in our university. But beyond that, you've invested a lot in people. And I know that you have a, a, a great reputation around town with people who are in the sports business. And, and that doesn't happen by accident. Um, it happens because you have found a way to try to treat people well in the process. And um, so I just, I, I guess something that I know about our personal friendship is that, well, I mean, we used to talk about sports all the time and, and we still do a lot of the time, but I, I think I think one of the things I'm most excited about in, in, in where we are in terms of our relationship these days in our 60s, <laughs> I'm, I'm about three years ahead of you there. I it don't don't we want to see a, 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 an improvement in in the way we all interact with each other and the yeah. and the, the tone uh, that we use when we talk about other people. I mean. Don't you think there's a, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but don't you think there's a hunger and a, a desire in more people than we realize to be part of something really encouraging and positive as opposed to just always, you know, trying to one up each other or take each other down? I, I am, you know, I am so much wanting that for our country and our world. And, and I'm trying to do my part to listen and pause when I want to say something that's not going to help the situation. Um, you know, I did, I did some doctoral studies. I've come up short uh, finishing that. I would like, by the way, I'd like to finish that. If, it, if I'm ever given the opportunity to do that, I'd like to finish that and, and become Dr. Ruff as, as you are Dr. Johnson. You worked hard for that, but I want to earn it. But one of the things that in those studies that I did was, was learning about that and how to do that better. And I've tried to put that into practice. And I, I want less arguments. I want more discussion. I want 
to be able to hear somebody who I don't agree with and let them say what they want to say and get it off their chest and make them feel safe. And I think that's what I think that's what that's about is letting people feel safe enough around you to say the things maybe even that they know you don't agree with. Yeah. But that you're not going to bite their head off in return. I think that's what we have to do. And I've tried to yeah. do that in social media. I've had but I've tried to do it more in person, even even in my own family and families. We sometimes say things to each other that uh, we shouldn't. And we think it's OK because we're family. Well, no, it's it's actually not OK. Uh, yeah, we can forgive each other maybe a little bit more, but we need to work at not saying that thing and things that require someone to forgive us. And so we need to treat each other that way in our families and outside and practice it at home. That was another thing my dad used to say, practice what you want to be like outside of the house at home. And um, so I'm trying to do that better myself. But I think you're right. I, what you did in your dissertation was exactly what we need to do. And that's be grateful. And it starts with being grateful. And I am grateful and I want to act like it, you know, um, and that's 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 where I want to go with. It. So, yes, I'm I am full bore into trying to find a, uh, a return to how we treat each other with respect and dignity, even when we disagree. You and I could talk for hours about all kinds of things because we've spent all kinds of hours with each other across the years. Yeah. I Every now and then I'll be riding down one of the interstates or even one of the, you know, lesser traveled highways. Um, and I think I remember that restaurant, or <laughs> that rest stop, or that Dairy Queen with, yes. with Craig Ruff because we were, we were on the road somewhere to try to tell people about you know, Trebekah basketball games mm-hmm. or other, other things. Here's, here's, here's the way I kind of want to wrap this up. There's two things. Folks, be like Greg Ruff. Get out there in the middle of doing something good for somebody else. Tell somebody else's story, and maybe they'll want to hear yours a little more. And be a cheerleader for somebody else. Um, it It's a great way to live. And and as you and I both know, Greg, it doesn't always make a lot of money, but <laughs> boy, isn't it <laughs> isn't it a great way to live? It is. It is. I, I would I would not trade uh, what I've done. There's been some moments, but I would not trade what I've done and how I've done it. And I and I want to continue to get better. So yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, I love you, bro. Uh, I love you too. It, it's great to do all these different things we've done together across the years, and I really wanted you to be on. Uh, that side of the interview this time to tell some of your story. You're a, uh, you're a, uh, you're a true treasure. And, um, uh, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. Uh, Thank you very much. It means a lot coming from you, especially, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to get on here and share and talk about some things like that. Hey, we'll, uh, we'll have another episode for you down the road for now. And like we used to kind of close every now and then for Greg Ruff, I'm Michael Johnson. And we'll see you next time.